So here's the thing. The general purpose computer is already everywhere. It's in your car, it's in your oven, it's in your thermostat, it's in your phone, and soon enough it'll be in your clothes and even under your skin. Assistive devices combined with general purpose computers have the power to be even better than the wetware that they replace. So for example, um, I'm a member of the Walkman and iPod generation, which means that I'm almost certain to go at least partially deaf before I die, assuming I live the full complement of years. And I expect that I'll have a hearing aid, and I'd be really surprised if that hearing aid didn't come with a buffer. Uh, and I'd be even more surprised if it didn't come with some wireless communication to allow it to directly receive input from, uh, from whatever device I'm carrying. I, who needs a mobile phone, Bluetooth headset when you've got a hearing aid already inserted? The Bluetooth hardware doesn't cost much to add to it. But um, as soon as you start to say, well, what if that hearing aid was designed to run software that you couldn't control? What if that hearing aid was designed so that you couldn't inspect its workings? What if that hearing aid was designed to run software that if you knew it was there, you'd object to it being there? All of a sudden, the idea of having very powerful general purpose computing devices, not just on our person, but in our person, becomes a lot more frightening. Designing general purpose computers to sneak around behind their backs is a terrible, their owners' backs is a terrible idea. We've already seen what happens when you add just a little bit of control to your network or your computer. Um, more, most recently during the Arab Spring, we, we had the, uh, the terrible spectacle of Iran and Egypt's secret police mining Facebook to figure out who to arrest. Virus writers and identity thieves have already figured out that if there's some anti-copying software running on a computer that hides itself from the computer's uh, own processes, that that's a great place to run your virus. Right? As soon as you've got a, a program running on the computer that says, um, don't show me when you list out all the processes on the computer, the right thing to do with your malicious software is to join that class of programs because that's a great place to be because all the antivirus stuff can't see it and nor can the user detect it. Um, Building general, uh, once we create the facility to lawfully intercept terrorist communications or to speedily take down copyright infringement or to interdict pirate software or to prevent bad radios from running, we also build the tools by which tyrants, crooks, snoops, and jerks can spy on and control us. Building general purpose PCs that are just a little bit locked down are like finding, uh, are like finding a person who can become just a little bit pregnant. Once the facility can be used for a legitimate purpose, it's also liable to being used for an illegitimate purpose. So we, as, as a novelist, I might call it Chekhov's Law of Narrative, that the gun on the mantelpiece in Act 1 is bound to go off by Act 3. So that's the one thing. But the other thing is that there are plenty of bad things that general purpose computers can really, really do. I don't want an airplane's air traffic control signal to be clobbered by some dork who just wants to boost the signal on his Wi-Fi network. I don't want child porn to circulate. I don't want superbugs being printed on desktop printers by weird apocalyptic nutcases or absent-minded sloppy idiots. But regulating general purpose PCs and general purpose networks won't stop these things from happening. General purpose PCs and general purpose, compute and general purpose networks are commodities and there will always be unhobbled versions of them to be had, which means that only the good, honest people will have a hard time laying hands on them and only the good will be put out by the regulation. At the beginning, I talked about why we don't regulate cricket bats, but regulating general purpose computers is more like regulating the wheel. We all use them, and though they can do much harm, it would be an absurd act of totalitarianism to turn them into controlled substances. Which brings me to the conclusion of the talk. We need to come up with effective means of regulating the real problems uh, that the collapse of prior restraint regulation makes possible before planes start falling out of the sky. And the first step to doing that is to stop pretending that we can make PCs just a little bit pregnant. The way that we do that is by coming up with after-the-fact solutions that will actually mitigate and reduce harm. So when, I, when this all started with the FCC's rules around radios, I started to ask all the radio engineers and electrical engineers what they thought we should do, uh, everyone I met. And w w the best answer I got was from a guy named Andrew Huang, who... Um, uh, calls himself Bunny Huang, and he wrote a book called Hacking the Xbox. He was the guy who, who uh, reverse engineered the Xbox. He founded a company called Chumbi. He's done some very good computer science work. And he said, well, look, if all of us have software-defined radios in our pockets, which we will, and if they all have tunable antennas, which they will, and if some people's 
devices end up clobbering them, which they will, either through negligence or through malice, then we are all situated to triangulate on the location of those devices and to report on them in real time and to make it possible and even likely that an authority can find out where the person doing the dumb thing is and ask them to stop or make them stop. Um, that effectively, not the, the collapse of the prior restraint regulation model is also the collapse of the need for the prior restraint regulation model. The reason we want to control what radios can do after they enter the field is because it was considered tractable to control the design of a radio, but impossible to control the use of the radio once it left the design phase and entered the field. What's happened now is almost a complete reversal, where controlling the design of the radio is intractable because changing the design requires merely changing code. But finding the radios that are being used poorly once they're in the field becomes obvious and easy because once those radios are being used to disrupt communications, um, that becomes a, a quite obvious, at least in denial of service attacks, there are probably less obvious means of tinkering with communications or interfering with communications. But at least on the gross level and on increasingly finer levels, it becomes easy to figure out when radios are doing naughty things, especially when it matters. Um, another example that, that made me think about um, regulation and uh, uh, after the fact and regulation that might in fact work it was the remarkable courage of a group of German child sexual abuse survivors who came out against the implementation of a German firewall of a child, uh, uh, to interdict child pornography materials. And what they said was that when this material disappears from the internet, uh, it merely makes it easy to ignore that it's happening. That when the material uh, and, and, allow, and still allows pedophiles to get uh, access to it, that taking all the enforcement efforts that we're currently using to put this, the, the evidence of these crimes out of sight and out of mind and diverting it to finding the sex tourists who are producing the videos and the traffickers who are involved in it um, would in fact stop children from coming to harm in a way that blocking it, uh, ineffectively blocking it doesn't. Um, I like the thinking, I like this kind of thinking because on the one hand it works and on the other hand without this kind of solution we have this regulatory vacuum that will be filled by people who reflexively add spyware and censorship and lockdown because at least we're doing something. Uh, in various guises the fight over universal computing and networking will become the major regulatory battle for the next 30 years and will be at the core of the way that we all love, learn, work and play. And so it's a question that I'm hoping all of you will, will start thinking about. I don't have great answers for how we solve these problems, but at least I know what won't work. Thank you. You can find out more about research and courses in some of the technologies discussed in this seminar by going to www.mct.open.ac.uk.